Good morning, everyone. Two minutes to 11 this October the 24th. We're sort of into the last week of October or almost. Um, what's been happening here? Well, um, Victoria reached the 70% fully vaccinated target, and so a lot of restrictions have eased. And um, by the time I'm here next week, God willing, I will have had a haircut, which is quite momentous. And yes, we're into spring, so we had two days well into the 20s, and then we're back down to 17 degrees. But it's still a lovely, lovely season. I think it is in most parts of, well, anywhere in the world I've been, spring is a lovely season. And one of the things we're particularly happy about this spring is that we have more native birds coming around. Last year, we saw one lorikeet on Graham's birthday, and that was it. Whereas this morning, there were at least four in the trees. We have a small garden, very small garden, but we have two big trees. And um, there were lorikeets refusing to be chased away by the miners. And it was quite nice to see these beautiful birds and see them being quite feisty. Um, because we've reached the 70% double vaccination re um, mark, milestone, milestone, I was able to go out for coffee with a friend um, and sit in beautiful sunshine outside. And the place was a, bub, a buzz with um, people thinking, is this how it's going to be? Sadly, we still have very high case numbers and too high deaths. But as vaccinations creep up, romp up in some places, we're hoping they will go down. OK, I'll hand over to Graham. Well, thank you, Christine. It's just gone 11 o'clock, and Christine's already been considering the birds of the air. So. A uh, lovely thing to be able to do in the morning. Welcome to uh, our service this morning, uh, streamed live from the uh, little church building in Gardenia Street, Blackburn. A warm welcome. If, you, uh, if you're with us regularly, you'll know that we have a, a handout, a weekly leaflet that uh, we, we produce. It has an outline of what's said in the service this morning, uh, and you can get details of our church from that leaflet on the church's website. Uh, it's uploaded week by week, and uh, past copies are there as well. Uh, as, we, as we begin then, I'm going to invite you to join with me in prayer, and we'll have our uh, familiar stream service. I hope it's familiar to many of you by now. So let us pray. Almighty God, we, we thank you for the rhythm of our lives. We thank you that uh, daytime and nighttime uh, follow one another. We thank you for the seasons. We thank you in the southern hemisphere for the spring and for the signs of new growth and for the birds. And, and remember Jesus' invitation to consider the birds and to think about things. And we want to thank you too for all that gives our lives shape and structure and provides a uh, comfort for us, but we come to you mindful that there are things that we do not have control over, and we, we look to you to provide wise counsel for those who guide and lead us, and we pray today that as Christian people seek to offer you their praise and to learn more about the way of Jesus, that they might represent him in the world. We pray that you would, by your spirit, use what we share this morning and use us all week by week and day by day that we might be heralds of a new way of living and of a new life that Jesus brings. So touch us and touch Christian people everywhere with your presence, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. I'm going to call Christine back for Young at Heart. Thank you, Christine. So we've entitled this um, All the Love in My Heart. Um, on Thursday night, 
there was a very brief snippet on the news about an eight-year-old girl called Ramaya who lives in Tasmania. She has three dogs and a cat. But in her own words, I realized I had enough love in my heart to look after other animals. She's obviously quite the entrepreneur and now earns pocket money caring for other people's animals. I need to ring a warning bell about this story. On Friday, when I looked on the internet, I found quite a bit of information about Ramaya's um, business on the internet, including a Facebook page. But yesterday morning, when I sat down at the kitchen bench to type up this talk, I couldn't find any. I think this probably means that her parents realized it was not wise to have information about an eight-year-old freely available online. However, I want to come back to the train of thought sparked by her words when she said, I realized I have enough love in my heart to look after other people's animals. They brought to my mind the words of a hymn, for the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. I was reminded of two passages in the Old Testament, and I think, um, are you, did you say you were putting them up? Um, one is Matthew 10, chap, ver, chapter 10, verses 17 to 22, and I will read them. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honour your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. Go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. This young man wanted eternal life. He was drawn to Jesus but somehow his wealth was more important than following Jesus. I should add, I don't believe there is anything intrinsically wrong about being wealthy. It's when your wealth stops you following God wholeheartedly that it becomes a problem. So for all his noble strivings, and despite probably seeing the love in Jesus' eyes, the young man chose to walk away. The second passage I thought of um, is in various Gospels, but I'm reading the account from Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39. Jesus speaking. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those who sent you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. It's a beautiful image of two of the hen gathering her chicks. And another very beautiful one that we've seen sometimes after bushfires is a mother hen dead on her eggs, but the eggs and the chicks inside them have been saved. So it's a very powerful in image of maternal love, parental love. Jesus is looking down on the city of Jerusalem with a heart full of love, even maternal love, but also full of grief, knowing about the destruction Jerusalem was bringing on itself. 
May we as individuals respond to God's love as he reaches out to us. May we as a country turn to him and not bring destruction on ourselves. And I'd now like to indulge myself in reading the whole hymn from which I quoted one verse. Now, you will find there, in total, we've seen in another version, this, this hymn is available in the Methodist hymn book and the Uniting Church hymn book with various verses, um, but both, both versions include these five, which I'm going to read now. There's a wideness in God's mercy like the wideness of the sea. There's a kindness in his justice which is more than liberty. There is no place where our sorrows are more keenly felt than heaven. There is no place where earth's failings have such gracious judgment given. There is plentiful redemption through the blood that Christ has shed. There is joy for all the members in the sorrows of the head. That verse is not in every version, I should say. There is plentiful redemption through the blood that Christ has shed. There is joy for all the members in the sorrows of the head. For the love of God is broader than the measure of our mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. If our love were but more simple, we should take him at his word, and our lives would be illumined by the glory of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Christine. Great hymn. Amanda's going to bring us our Bible reading now. Thanks, Amanda. Good morning, everyone. I'm reading today from the message version. Thanks to Benny for putting me onto that. Um, from Acts chapter 18, verses 18 to 28. Paul stayed a while longer in Corinth, but then it was time to take leave of his friends. Saying his goodbyes, he sailed for Syria, Priscilla and Aquila with him. Before boarding the ship in the harbour town of Cenchrea, he had his head shaved as part of a vow he had taken. They landed in Ephesus, where Priscilla and Aquila got off and stayed. Paul left the ship briefly to go to the meeting place and preach to the Jews. They wanted him to stay longer, but he said he couldn't. But after saying goodbye, he promised, I'll be back, God willing. From Ephesus he sailed to Caesarea. He greeted the church there and then went on to Antioch, completing the journey. After spending a considerable time with the Antioch Christians, Paul set off again for Galatia and Phrygia, retracing his old tracks, one town after another, putting fresh heart into the disciples. A man named Apollos came to Ephesus. He was a Jew, born in Alexandria, Egypt, and a terrific speaker, eloquent and powerful in his preaching of the scriptures. He was well educated in the way of the master and fiery in his enthusiasm. Apollos was accurate in everything he taught about Jesus, up to a point, but he only went as far as the baptism of John. He preached with power in the meeting place. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and told him the rest of the story. When Apollos decided to go on to Achaia province, his Ephesian friends gave their blessing and wrote a letter of recommendation for him, urging the disciples there to welcome him with open arms. The welcome paid off. Apollos turned out to be a great help to those who had become believers through God's immense generosity. 
He was particularly effective in public deba debate with the Jews as he brought out proof after convincing proof from the scriptures that Jesus was in fact God's Messiah. Amen. Thank you, Amanda. May God bless the reading of his word to us all this morning. To his name be the glory and the praise. Well, this morning's sermon has had a number of headings. The one that I put in the leaflet, I think, was uh, I'll be back, God willing, which are some words you heard Amanda read a moment ago. But then over the heading of the sermon itself, I put words that come from this poem. Um, perhaps you recognize it. It's uh, words which uh, Robert Burns, when he was plowing in a field one time as a young man, the plough turned over the nest of a field mouse and the mouse and its little ones just scattered. And so he, he wrote a poem to the mouse, it's called to, to a Mouse, and it contains these words, but Mousy, this is towards the end of the poem, but Mousy, thou art nor thy lane, in proving foresight may be vain, the best laid plans or the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay and lay us naught but grief and pain for a promised joy. So Robert Burns, uh, famous and the bard of Scotland indeed, um, and the title that I thought of that might be more suited to the uncertain times through which we've been living since we started streaming church on the 22nd of March in 2020, the uncertain times, especially for uh, for. For, well, not especially for us in Melbourne, it's been the same all around the world. Massive uncertainty, uh, an unseen enemy, a virus that's uh, uh, tragically f fatal unless you have uh, protection of various kinds. And so there's there've been uh, the idea of living in uncertain times brought back to me these words of Robert Burns, the best laid schemes of mice and men. But it's not just the uncertainties that he knew, and he was living at a time when there was a revolution in, in, the, in the United States and another one in France, and, and so there was, uh, a world was in ferment, really, uh, at that time. And so we might think, well, he lived through uncertain times. We've got our own degrees of uncertainty as well. Uh, geopolitical uncertainty, uh, global health uncertainty. But think about how these words might apply to the Apostle Paul, and especially as we look at these 10 verses, it's hard to, to uh, grasp that all that Amanda has read is really just 10 verses, uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 18 through to 28. And I'm just picking up on three simple ideas. First of all, I want to look at the itinerary that the Apostle Paul uh, embarked on and set out for us by Luke in, in, the, in the narrative. Then I want to look at the questions because there are several unanswered questions and uh, I'm, I'll probably sketch in a couple of the ideas that help people make sense of them. And then finally I want to think about the characters that we meet in this story and, and then reflect on the whole and ask, so what lessons for us? So let's think first of all about the itinerary. And I've used this map, uh, uh, well you, you've... Uh, You've seen it before in the, in the format of the London Underground. Now, the Roman roads uh, can be made to look like the London Underground. Unfortunately, it's a very poor image. I won't dwell on it. But if, if we think about the roads, they look nothing like that. The Roman roads uh, were not smooth highways that we have today. They were blocks of stone and they were placed. They're amazing roads. There's no doubt about that. Um, but they, uh, they were connected, of course, around this ancient world by sea lanes and and the sea lanes are, that we're thinking about today are the ones that are depicted in this image. Um, the crossing from Corinth in Greece to Western Turkey to Ephesus, then down to Caesarea, then up to Antioch. Let's, let me just take them through, you, you through them for a moment. We, we looked at Corinth last week and be, above Corinth is the Acropolis, it's called the Acro Corinth, where there was a temple to Aphrodite, uh, she set the tone for the port cities because there were actually two ports in the city of Corinth. 
The one on the eastern side was Genkria, which was where the apostle had his head shaved. And then uh, from there he went across uh, with uh, Aquila and Priscilla to Ephesus. Uh, some years ago, Christian and I had the privilege of visiting Ephesus with friends. And it's just astonishing to visit this theatre. Uh, the amphitheatre in Ephesus seats 20,000 people. If you can imagine something the size of the tennis centre in Melbourne. And it's so designed that uh, a person down on the, on the stage can speak so 20,000 people can hear with the unaided voice. Just totally astonishing. And so here's Ephesus, a city that's still being uncovered. The ancient city is still being uncovered. And there are new things being discovered there about the ancient world today. And then from there, uh, the apostle was to travel to Caesarea. But he wanted to go to Syria, uh, to Antioch in Syria. So why did he go down to Caesarea? Well, one of the suggestions is that the sea lanes were more uncertain than the roads and the prevailing winds at this time of the year probably took him, uh, they were probably northwesterlies rather than uh, straight westerlies. And so he, he, he was constrained by the prevailing winds. And he went to Caesarea. And I've put this little image here. You probably can't see it, but I invite you to look it up on the internet because Caesarea was built by Herod in honour of Caesar, Herod the Great. And in order to supply this coastal city with water, he built an aqueduct 15 kilometers long to bring fresh water into the city. And then later on, this was doubled in size by Herod when Herod, uh, not Herod, when, uh, when uh, it was built by Herod initially, but when Hadrian became the emperor, he doubled the size of the aqueduct. And it was also a, an enclosed aqueduct so that it was, uh, the water was protected from the evaporative effects of the sun to a great degree. And then, of course, he went to Jerusalem, to, well, to the temple there. Well, did he go to Jerusalem? Um, we'll come back to that question in a minute. And then up to uh, Antioch, which was the church that commissioned him. Right at the very beginning uh, of Paul's ministry from Antioch, we read that the church there selected him and Barnabas and sent them out. On the first missionary journey into uh, south-central Turkey, and then they came back and reported, and then he... Did, went on a second journey, which we've been following. Both of those journeys, uh, if he were to make them overland, would take him through the uh, Cilician Gateway. This is a, a, a massive cleft, as it were, between the, the lower plateau in the southwest, uh, southeast Turkey, going up onto what's called the Anatolian Plateau. And as you, tr as you climb a, a thousand meters up through the, the uh, up through the roads through there. Uh, there have, since ancient times, been this uh, gateway, as it's called, uh, up onto the Anatolian plateau, and then across. The one other place that's mentioned in the reading uh, I want to just draw your attention to is um, Alexandria. Uh, now, Paul didn't plan to visit Alexandria. Uh, the image I put on the screen is of a man uh, in a scuba diving equipment with a, with a camera and he's facing a sphinx, an underwater sphinx, uh, because the harbour at Alexandria is one of the amazing venues for underwater archaeology. If you knew the seven wonders of the ancient world, there was at Alexandria a lighthouse 40 storeys tall and that lighthouse eventually was uh, came down and it's believed that one of the fortresses there are made, is made of the stones of the lighthouse. But the, uh, the ancient city, a lot of the city is now under water and that's why we get this amazing image of a man looking a little bit like a sphinx, gazing actually at a sphinx and taking a film of it and you sort of think, here's the modern world meeting the ancient world. Paul never went to Alexandria, but somebody from Alexandria met Paul in today's readings, and we'll hear more about that later on. So that's the itinerary in a nutshell. Okay. So Christine's just asked me to go over the modern countries. Uh, so, this Greece. so 
We have uh, south of Greece, the Peloponnese here, with Corinth at the crossroads. Ephesus in western Turkey with the massive amphitheater. Coming across the Mediterranean to Caesarea, which is uh, one of the big tourist hotspots in, in, uh, in Israel today. Then, did Paul go up to Jerusalem or not? We'll come to that in a moment. Uh, the word Jerusalem isn't mentioned in the text, but most translations assume that Paul did. This is in Syria now, Syrian Antioch, and this is, this is all today in Turkey, but uh, the Cilician Gateway is climbing up onto the Taurus Mountains here. And this is where Paul's first missionary journey took him. But as we are going to, to hear probably next week, he didn't actually go up to the north. Remember, the, first, the second time uh, in the missionary journey, he came here, but it said the Spirit of the Lord prevented him from going into Asia. And, th and this part of Turkey used to be called Asia Minor. So, uh, so it, these are the countries represented on the screen. I'm apologizing for the poor quality of the map and of these images which I put in, they're rather small and apologize for that. So uh, the questions then that emerge, and I just want to touch on them. This is the itinerary, it's the Eastern Mediterranean. First of all, Paul had a haircut at Cancria. Why? Well, we don't know. <laughs> That's the short answer. We don't know why he had his hair cut. He made a vow of some kind. In Judaism, it was not uncommon to make a vow. Uh, if you read the Psalms, you'll read about the pilgrims journeying to Jerusalem in the Old Testament, singing the pilgrim Psalms and making a vow of what they would do in response to God for his goodness a sign of thankfulness, or perhaps as, a, as part of a prayer they would ask for God's blessing in the future. In particular, in the Old Testament, we have the idea of a Nazarite vow, that is, a vow which involved the shaving of the head. And, and these vows, uh, you'll find them mentioned, for example, in Numbers chapter 6. They, this would end with uh, a visit to the temple and uh, uh, an ending of the vow at Jerusalem. So was it a Jewish thing? Was Paul reverting to something Jewish? Well, the, the answer that uh, I think is most fits the situation is by uh, Ian Howard Marshall's commentary. He says this, Paul was simply expressing gratitude to God in the manner traditional at the time. Remember that God had said to him, don't be afraid, Paul. I've got many people in Corinth. Stay. You know, he lingered. He stayed a year and a half. So for safety through that long period when he was in a, a, a troubled and deeply conflicted city, there were, it was a very cosmopolitan place and all kinds of things could have happened. So perhaps it was just the simplest way to think about it is gratitude for something that God has given him and he wanted to go and express his, his thanks. So, uh, so that's the first thing. We, we don't actually know the vow, but he did have a haircut. Did he go to Jerusalem? Now, I pointed out that the message version of the Bible doesn't mention Jerusalem. It says he went to Caesarea and then up to Antioch. Now, whether or not he went to Jerusalem is, has got to do with the words that are used. Um, the word for Jerusalem is not used, but it does talk about going down to Antioch. He went down to Antioch. And the question is, why was he going down to Antioch? Because Caesarea is at sea level. And you didn't go down from Antioch, from, didn't go down anywhere from Caesarea except underwater. So the traditional language of the pilgrims was to go up to Jerusalem, to the temple, the high point, Mount Zion, and then to go down from there as you returned home. So to go down to Antioch, uh, most uh, scholars think it meant that he included a visit to the temple in Jerusalem where he paid his vow and gave thanks to God. So it's, it's uh, just a little in information about the text and its translation and it shows you the sorts of things that um, we have to pay attention to when we're, when we're reading the text. This is uh, of particular interest because... Uh, 
we know that the entire text of the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek at Alexandria, which I'll come to in a minute. All right, so, and we, the, the Jews learn things about translation uh, in that place. In fact, if you read the leaflet today, you'll find I've included a column uh, from uh, a scholar in Canada who tells us uh, about the translation called the Septuagint. The Jews appointed 70 uh, scholars to translate the text of the Old Testament, or the, the Pentateuch in particular, but the whole Old Testament was eventually translated into Greek. And so that translation is called the Septuagint, the 70. And if you're looking at footnotes, the number, the Roman numeral for 70, it represents those, that text, LXX. So, did Paul visit Jerusalem? Well, it seems likely that he did. And, for, and then he went down to Antioch, like the message version says, although it doesn't mention Jerusalem. So, that's uh, two questions. Why did he have his hair cut? Did he go to Jerusalem? And the third one was about Apollos, because Apollos gets a great report, and I think the translation from the message is just beautiful in, in describing him. Uh, but it says there was something. He says he only knew the baptism of John. What did that mean? Well, and what was it that he didn't know? Well, before we get to that, uh, we, have, we have to we turn to the characters in the story. So I want to just take a few minutes now to think about three uh, groups, three characters, uh, two, two individuals in one group. First of all, Priscilla and Aquila. You might have noticed last week that it was Aquila, a Jew from Rome, and his wife Priscilla who were in Corinth. Now they've journeyed across, uh, I always get mixed up here, is it the Adriatic or the Aegean Sea? I can't remember which it is. Um, I'm, I'm in the wonderful position of having had a dip in both of these seas, and I'd love to uh, have a little more time to enjoy them. But here we've crossed, a, we've crossed to Ephesus. Priscilla, Aquila, and Paul, all on the one boat. Priscilla and Aquila get off. Uh, Paul makes a brief visit to where the Christians are meeting as well. And, and, uh, and uh, Paul's gone on his journey, but Priscilla and Aquila encounter Apollos, and they discover he, he only knows the baptism of John. What does that mean? Well, you might be tempted to think it just means that he knew the story of Jesus up to John's baptism. But that doesn't really fit comfortably with the fact that he knew the way of the Lord, as we've already been told, and that he uh, was uh, it, knew, knowing the way of the Lord is a sort of a code word, code way of expressing right through Acts uh, a bit about being a disciple of Jesus. So it seems that, that, the, that Apollos knew quite a lot. But Priscilla detected a deficit. And what was the deficit in his knowledge? Well, she uh, alerted Aquila to this and they took Apollos aside and they explained more fully uh, the way of the Lord. Uh, they went that, just that little bit extra and said uh, what he needed to know. Now, I don't think he could possibly only have known up to the baptism of Jesus and not known about the ministry that followed from that, about his trial, about his death, and about his resurrection. Those things are there from the very beginning of Acts as part of the way of the Lord. This is the, this is the Savior who gives himself for his people. So uh, Apollos seems to have known that. And it, it seems most likely to me that what Apollos didn't know was that Jesus had reissued a command to baptize, which we get at the end of Matthew's Gospel, that his disciples were to go into all the world and make disciples and preach the good news and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So was, was it this? It seems that this would be the most likely deficit that he had. But the important thing here with respect to Priscilla and Aquila is that here Priscilla's name comes first. 
And later on, when Paul is writing to the Romans, he puts Priscilla's name first. So it seems that in some ways, uh, Luke has recorded for us, and Paul wrote to uh, Priscilla ahead of her husband. And this wasn't just being polite, because it wasn't the usual way to do it in the ancient world. It seems that uh, here Priscilla took a leading role. And I think Luke is, writes very favorably in terms of women's, the service given by women in the Christian church. And uh, certainly uh, women and slaves were drawn into the Christian church in large numbers from early on. So Apollos, he, he knew only the baptism of John. He didn't seem to know that when people became disciples of Jesus, they themselves should experience a baptism, a washing. It's a kind of a movie, as it were, of what God is doing. He's washing us. He's refreshing us. He's bringing life to us. All of these things that are symbolized in water as we uh, experience what it is to be made new as his disciples. Apollos, I think, didn't know of this final command of Jesus. You may wish to read and speculate more widely, but that satisfies my soul. And finally, Paul. Paul had to get used to his plans changing. Uh, Paul liked to have his hit the way ahead of him set out. You remember he knew he was there holding the garments we read in, in Acts uh, of the young man of the, of the men who were stoning Stephen to death. He was against this new cult, this Jewish Jesus, this Messiah claim. And so he went with letters from the high priest to Damascus to take them and bring them back to Jerusalem. He was so opposed to them. This was the Apostle Paul. But his plans were changed. God stopped him in his tracks. He, was, he fell to the ground. He heard a voice and he was blinded. And he was led by the hand into the city. And the believers whom he had gone to persecute, they welcomed him. Brother Saul, they said. And, and so he was cared for by them. And he, he had been draw, drawn up short by Jesus. And this is what conversion is, isn't it? It means to be turned around. And so here all his plans were turned around. But it wasn't just his plan to uh, subvert Christianity and the message about Jesus. It's almost as if everywhere he went, things didn't go quite like he planned. He, John Mark was to go with them, but remember John Mark didn't keep going. John Mark stayed back. Uh, so that there was something that happened on the first missionary journey that uh, didn't go according to plan. He was planning to go, as I've already mentioned when we were looking at the map, across into what, what is south, the Turkish coast on the, on the west, uh, what was called Asia Minor in those days. But it said in, in Acts that the Spirit of the Lord wouldn't let him go there, and so he went more northerly. And from there he got a call to Macedonia, come across to Macedonia and help us. And so he went down the Via Ignatia and then down into Greece. And, and as he did all this, he, he was encountering hostility in the synagogues again and again and again. The only exception being uh, the, the Jewish synagogue in Berea, who wanted to check it and they found that they couldn't gainsay what he was saying. It was as the scriptures said. So the question was, you know, here's Paul and he's making plans and thinking of the future. But one by one, things, his plans are interrupted. He's even, in his last great journey to Rome, blown off course altogether. Uh, he's going as a prisoner to Rome. And, and uh, that's an amazing journey to read in the closing chapters of the book of Acts. I think we'll stop our studies in Acts before we get there. But it's just worth reading anyway. So, so many things could change his plans. So the question is, would Paul come back to Ephesus? And he says, I'll be back, God willing. Now just let me take you back to that poem that I began with. So here is the, here's the, the first verse of the poem once again. But mousy, thou art no thy lane. You're not alone, little mouse. In proving foresight may be vain. 
the best laid schemes of mice and men gang after glay, they go astray, uh, and leave us naught but grief and pain for promised joy. So Robert Burns is telling us this. What do we know about Robert Burns? Well, he's been described as a wistful agnostic. Uh, in in uh, letters, his many letters have been read, and he, he, can connect, he spoke to uh, people who were very familiar with the Christian faith, and, and, and in, his, in his writings he's been described by those who know him well as a, a wistful agnostic. And so this is the final verse of his poem. Still, thou art blessed compared with me. So this is the mouse. The mouse is blessed compared with me. The present only toucheth thee. But oh, I backward cast my eye on prospects drear, and forward, though I cannot see, I guess and fear. So these are the words that stand out as he looks back and as he looks forward. Prospects drear, I guess and fear. The Apostle Paul didn't have that attitude at all. What did he think? Well, he was used to his plans changing and he had to bear in mind that God could turn over his plans in an instant. But when he looked back, he looked back to forgiveness. He had, been, he had done terrible things, but there was forgiveness and there was love. Later on, he's to write to the Corinthians that magnificent chapter, a piece of immortal writing almost, uh, read again and again at funerals, sorry, at weddings around the world about that passage about love. Um, and so, so here is the apostle and he sees that he's been grasped by a love that, well, Christine spoke about such love already. And then when he looks at the future, he doesn't see him stumbling from one crisis to another. He's not fearful. He's learned to trust God. And that all things, as he writes to the Romans, all things work together for good to those who love him. And these are the words that are read again and again at funerals. So from weddings to funerals, uh, great events in our human lives. The Apostle Paul sees the past and the future cared for uh, by a God who loves him and has called him to share this love and the joy. So we must ask ourselves, does that love, that joy undergird our lives in the uncertainties through which we're living and the future which we cannot foretell, have we a deep sense that we are loved and that God will provide for us day by day? I pray that it might be so. As we think about these things, I'm going to ask Amanda to uh, bring us uh, our meditation time this morning. Uh, she's going to play from, um, I beg your pardon, I haven't changed that, to Telemann. You'll tell us. Thanks, Amanda. So this week, it's some more Telemann. Thank goodness for God that he was so prolific. And I can keep on bringing you something different. <laughs> um, so he, he wrote Fantasia's 13 for violin and can, uh, solo violin, solo viol de gamba, flute, all solo. And um, this is from his uh, yeah, violin Fantasia's actually transposed it, viola. And this is from his second one, a largo, a slow largo and an allegro.
Thank you, Amanda. I find myself uh, thinking about an expression of uh, Eugene Peterson, the, the man who wrote the message. Somewhere in it he talks about he translates it as God working us into his most excellent harmonies. And I think it's a lovely expression. And uh, part of our prayer is that God will take our lives and work them into his most excellent harmonies. So we come to a time of prayer and I'm going to lead you in prayer as uh, we precede uh, saying the Lord's Prayer together. So shall we pray? Almighty God, our Creator and Redeemer, we bow in humility before you and acknowledge that we do not know what a day nor an hour might bring forth. As it is written, we make our moves and cast our votes, but it's God who has the final say. Thank you for the way of Jesus and the invitation to follow in the steps of the one who gave himself the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. Develop in us the mind of Christ, that we too may be your servants. Help us to plan wisely and be guided by your Spirit, day by day, this week. We seek to do the good works that you have prepared for us. As we slowly emerge from what we hope would be a one-week lockdown that lasted 77 days, we're grateful to you for the way in which the competing demands for public health and safety have been worked through in our community. We ask that children returning to school will speedily resume healthy friendships and that businesses reopening and reorienting will prosper even as they observe the practices that reduce the transmission of COVID and minimize the demands on hospital staff and facilities. Aware of the resurgence of COVID in many places, we pray that the opening up of domestic and international travel will be safely managed as people take again to the roads, the seas and the skies. We pray for the poor who are immobilized by poverty and illness. We remember your apostles' injunction to remember the poor. We pray for the church in Vietnam today and the hostility it endures from those who resent the colonial past and perceive Christianity as a foreign religion. Strengthen Christians in that country to demonstrate that the disciples of Jesus do not owe their identity to either East or West but to one from the Mideast who is more deeply human than can be explained. We ask that among all the countries of Southeast Asia, where tensions exist, and especially between China and Taiwan, South and North Korea and Japan, the growing witness of the churches will erode hostility and set many on the path of peace. We pray for COP21 in Glasgow, asking that it will not be hijacked by disruptive and anarchistic violence, but that real progress will be made among leaders to initiate practical steps that address the climate issues that affect the poor of the world most directly, all of us in reality, and our children most especially. We pray for the missing four-year-old girl in West Australia, Cleo Smith, and for her distraught family. We pray she might yet be returned safely to them. Thank you for all who have participated in the search. Bless the work of all who search for the lost. Help us be generous with our time, our talents and energy. May your love fill our hearts that we may demonstrate the presence of your kingdom. So bless the work of Christian churches in our local communities and among us all who have journeyed from hearth and home to share the message of Jesus in other places. We commit to you our elderly, our frail and our sick friends this morning and we ask you to care for them as we pause
Lord, there are many. We lift them in our hearts to you now. We ask that with, uh, with us they might join together in uh, the prayer you taught your children. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Once again, I'll use the uh, benediction from the letter to the Colossians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and those whom you love today and always.